Hagen theory says that China, for various reasons, has high savings, probably too high. Anyway, China wisely decided to pack some of those savings temporarily abroad in the United States, the line treasuries, until the, the capital, uh, the uh, allocation of capital can be done more efficiently in China, until the capital market improved, and until the public administration system has improved. Now, I did ask one Chinese gentleman who's not an economist, he's just an average sort of citizen, and, and tried to find out from him, but what do you think? If the federal, if the central government had more funds available, how would it spend them? And he said, well, they have to give it, uh, have to pass it on to provincial administrations, and the provincial administrations are well, he used another word, but I would say not very efficient. <laughs> and so I deduce that the, the very wisely the Chinese authorities decided to pack some of these funds abroad, temporarily, until they've improved the allocation of resources and uh, both the public sector and the private sector. And that seems to me a fairly rational explanation, though I don't think it's one that's actually been consciously used or said in China. But I look forward to hearing from Chinese economists why they think you know, this policy has been followed. Well, now the third part, uh, I have two minutes, right? Okay. Um, the third part, which is the most interesting part, if you're all going to read it, is what has been the effect of the surplus on the rest of the, on the world economy. Now, to give you a way of thinking about it, it's all in here, really, it's like this. At the margin, China sells uh, labor intensive goods, it's called it clothing, to the United States. And the United States sells pieces of paper called treasury bonds, treasury bills of bonds, to China. It's a first trade. Now, of course, when the, the United States sells these bonds to the United States, that carries an implication that eventually the, uh, China can go back to the Americans and say, here are the bonds in a year, a few years' time. Now, uh, we want to, to spend them, right? And they want goods. <coughs> so China is wanting, giving up consumption today for the sake of consumption tomorrow. And um, uh, the United States is doing the opposite. And that's called <coughs> intertemporal trade. And I've written a whole article about that. <laughs> Now, I'm almost finished, you right? <laughs> The uh, question then is, is that good or bad for the countries of the United States, for example? And the United States, for example, decided to engage in a war without raising taxes. Why did it do that? Because of intertemporal trade with countries like China. So that gives you a key to the implication of the Chinese policies for other countries. Now, we, uh, there were about, uh, uh, apart from the United States, there were three other countries that had large, significant uh, big deficits in this period, who were borrowers, not directly from China, in the world capital market. They were uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom, um, Australia, and Spain. Now, Spain had a big housing boom, but the biggest percentage of GDP was the biggest borrower, more than the United States, a percentage of GDP. Well, there's a kind of trade, intertemporal trade going on between deficit and surplus countries. Now, a final point to make, and now I only have half a minute, which is that China was only one of the surplus countries in the world. Uh, if we list the major surplus countries in that period I'm talking about, it's the last, uh, since 2005, 2004, some of that, was Japan, China, Germany, and the oil exporting countries as a group. And that includes Babel, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. In 2007, I got figures from the IMF, one of the IMF documents, that indicated that China's surplus was 21.7% of all the surplus. So that puts it in perspective. When people talk about the big world global imbalances, the surplus and the deficits, they sometimes talk about it's just the United States and China. Well, on the deficit side, it was certainly dominated by the United States, or there were other countries that I mentioned. But on the surplus counter side, China was only 21.7 percent. That was significant. And the oil exporting group was larger, actually, in most uh, periods. And the earlier period, Japan was larger. I included Germany, didn't I? I mentioned that. Now, another small thing 
in Europe, Germany was the biggest surplus country, and Spain was the biggest deficit country. And then there are other deficit countries, and there are other surplus countries. And for the whole of the Eurozone, uh, it more or less cancel out, so they appeared to be almost in balance. <coughs> and then the time people say, and it's a curious thing, they, they say, they write down, oh, the Europeans haven't really made a contribution to all this because they're in balance. And balance is wonderful, is it? But that's only because they choose to aggregate particular countries. Now, if we took all the Pacific countries, the United States, Australia, Japan and China, you might also come close to balance. <laughs> and here's something very interesting. This is really a, a revelation, isn't it? That if you take all the world together, <laughs> and you take all the surpluses and all the de it's not going to be funny. This is a very serious matter. <laughs> if you take all the surpluses and all the deficits together, well, statistically, they don't cancel it uh, equal because of statistical problems. Because if there are no statistical problems, all the surplus will be equal to all the deficits. And the global imbalances, by magic, will disappear. <laughs> but I think I've just about said enough, but anything else I want to say is the chapter that you're going to read. <laughs>